We live in a world where mistakes are commonplace, yet accountability for them is nowhere to be found. Today, October 30th, 2022, a day that will go down in history, for it is on this day that I take full responsibility in admitting for all the world to hear that I was incorrect. My assumption that Mr. Bones was the being behind the villainous voyeurism plaguing Blue Valley was incorrect. I am sorry. I've seen Stargirl Season 3, Chapter 8, entitled Infinity, Inc., Part 2, so now it's time to talk about it. Be careful, spoilers are ahead, now let's do this. It's probably more obvious that this episode is a direct continuation of the previous, I suppose the Part 2 probably gave that away, and I must say that this episode had several of the things that I find fun in stories. Chief among them is the somewhat surreal realms that don't quite follow the rules of physics and show backstories. And I know that's a fairly cliche trope at this point in our history, but that's the type of thing that, when done well, I find wonderful, at least in my opinion. Now, if you recall just after Jenny and Co. finally located her brother last episode, they took him out from under some protective lighting, and his shadow form just basically exploded outwards, swallowing up both Pat and the Shade. This led the pair to arrive, albeit a bit confused, in the Shadowlands. And keep in mind, the Shadowlands are the place that the Shade is able to travel to while using his powers. So you would think that right off the bat, he would have full control and full knowledge of how this place works, that doesn't necessarily turn out the way you would think, and this part of the episode is where I found most of the fun. Not only did we get to have some interesting moments with horror-ish elements, which is perfect for the season, but we also got that interesting backstory and character development in fun ways that are more than just having our characters talk about it or having them reveal things in a less interesting way. I really liked, and I guess that's kind of a crappy way to say it, but I... I suppose maybe appreciated is a better word. The whole look at the relationship of Pat struggling regarding his father and in turn his own son, Mike. I very much enjoyed the whole look at Pat's father and the subtle way that they showed the 1940s or 1950s era stuff. That helps flesh out the whole idea that Pat, as well as the rest of the JSA, were blasted forwards in time. I understand this is something that the show has never really addressed, but it's definitely core to their story, at least within the comics, and I do believe that in one of the tie-in comics that was released earlier this year, that actually was explored and explained. Not sure they're ever actually going to address that on the show, but it is something that's fundamental to these characters, and it adds a lot that they're actually adding that element into the show. Now, there was one point later on in the show that seemingly possibly contradicted that, but I think that was just a throwaway joke and it doesn't really apply to anything. Seeing how Pat is also worried that Mike will grow up to hate him kind of in the same vein that he's portrayed as hating his father in these flashbacks, even though he claims he isn't. It's interesting that he actually realizes and acknowledges the fact that he's failing to pay enough attention to Mike, and I thought that was great. It's nice to see that he actually has all of this guilt building up within himself, while at the same time he tends to be the character everyone looks at to hold things together, and the fact that there's more going on beneath the surface I think will most likely come back into play later on in the season, especially when he's reunited with the whole team and Mike. The only thing I think could have added a little more to this interaction was Sylvester. I understand that, you know, he may not have wanted to be in this episode because he's not a main character and they slimmed it down to more of a family oriented thing. But there's clearly a whole bag of issues going on with their relationship. And uh, the fact that he came back from the dead and now they have this whole sort of role reversal going on. It would have been great to see that drawn out into the light a little bit via this realm of fear or whatever you want to call it. And I also really, really loved seeing the shades oft hinted at backstory. That was great. He is fast becoming one of my favorite recurring characters on this show, and I would truly hate to lose him for good. And the fact that they're actually now showing this, uh, I don't want to say traumatic backstory, but this, this backstory that's been hinted at between himself and his sister, that was a good little look into this character. And it's very fascinating to note that the Shade has been alive for over 100 years. Now, while I mentioned earlier the rest of the JSA was kind of flung into the future, this guy's actually lived throughout all that time. He has seen the world go from basically no electronic technology to the world we're in today. And that has got to be a culture shock, and the fact that this guy has lived through it all 
and he still kind of got this whole guarded thing about himself. That makes a lot of sense. The only real people he had in his life are long gone. He's failed to build any real connections over the years, even when he was in the ISA. So this guy is way out of time, and he's got nothing but himself in this world. So to see what happens later on in this episode, coupled with what happened earlier in his life, I think that gives a lot of great development for this character and a lot of places to go in the future. Now to circle back to my apology tour, we spent a fair amount of time at the Helix Institute with Courtney and of course Jenny and her brother, and this is where Mr. Bones is located. Now he explains the whole purpose of this place with his backstory, and basically you can think of it like a slightly more sinister X-Mansion from Marvel Comics The X-Men, all of that. His mother was someone who was experimented on while he was still in her womb, and that turned him into the thing that he is today. He has transparent gelatinous flesh, and he's got what they call a cyanide touch. This is what killed his mother during his birth, and it also contains the ability to kill any living thing that he touches. So he created this place, this institute, this house, whatever you want to call it, in order to house, contain, and train all of those with worrying abilities of potential problematic effects, especially, you know, those with powers that uncontrolled could wreak havoc in the world. And that's exactly what he was trying to do with Jenny's brother there. And that's the same reason he didn't require Jenny to stay there or he wouldn't want someone like Courtney, because these are all characters who don't have to have their abilities. Courtney has the staff, she can put it away. Jenny has the ring, but she has more of a control over it. He's more interested in the people that are, I guess, equivalents to mutants in the X-Men. They can't take off their powers. They are what they are. There's no turning it off. There's no casting it aside. They are now permanently what they are, and the only way is to control that, contain it, to protect themselves and the world. So he isn't necessarily coming across like the supervillain that we were led to believe he may be. Now, I'm sure there's probably some more sinister motives hiding underneath the surface, more so than just your noble guy. But for the time being, he isn't that enemy that uh, we were all kind of assuming he was going to be. Now, this revelation leads Courtney to believe, as many of us have at this point, that he was the one surveilling them, all the cameras in Blue Valley, all of that stuff. However, he and his nurse claim that is not the case. Why would they surveil them? They had no need to do that because they had enough information on their own. We then see the one actually doing this from behind and hooded, so we still don't have confirmation on who it actually is, smashing his monitor after seeing our version of Our Man on camera from last episode. I'm still going to run with my Dragon King theory from way back at the beginning of the season, but the way he looked to have a human flesh wrist and the cloak he was wearing, could it actually be the original Our Man? I've seen this theory floating around a little bit too. I don't think I want that to be true, I actually think that might be a little out there, but heck, I would actually prefer it to be Sylvester over the original Hour Man because he hasn't actually had any buildup in the show at this point. But if they load the back half with more backstory about him, maybe I would feel that would land a bit better. But as always, this show tends to be great at flipping the script and throwing a twist that you didn't see coming that actually works. So whatever they're planning to do, I have faith that they're going to do it well. I just hope that whoever it is has had enough establishment in the show to feel earned. That's my only concern right now. While I didn't really miss them because of the way this episode was structured, the other JSA members were completely absent, except, as I mentioned, in that brief shot that they showed, which is a carryover from last episode. This wouldn't be very problematic, except for the fact that we've had very little with them this year to begin with. So hopefully, hopefully, the entire rest of the season implements them fully. It's always fantastic to see Jenny, and I wish she were able to stick around and become a true cast member on the show, but she, her bro, and the Shade left to uh, train and to track down another child that Jenny was in contact with, the Child of the Sandman, a character we haven't really talked about that much in this show yet, but he was also a pivotal member of the JSA. So I really hope that'll get paid off later on. That's a very cool thought, and I just hope the show lasts long enough to fulfill the promise of this whole new JSA team actually coming together at some point, whether or not that's the end of the season, season four, Whatever. I have a sinking feeling the show's not going to come back after this with all the crap going on over at HBO, but I have no actual confirmation on that right now, so fingers crossed we'll get more of them. I really enjoyed seeing the Gambler return also. He was only in a brief scene in the Shadowlands, but it was great to have him back and still feel like part of the show. And all in all, this might have to be my favorite episode of the season, but what do you guys think? 
How are you finding this very different season of Stargirl? Leave all your thoughts below, triple kick that like button, and until next time, keep on shining.